do want to bring our Eastern Conference reporter Tim Bontemps into the conversation. What more can you tell us about how long Jalen Brown may be out? What is this injury? Well, Malika, Jalen Brown, as you saw him there in that collision with Jason Tatum, suffered a facial fracture last night. It's unclear how long he's going to be out, but certainly, as you saw in that game last night, the Celtics have the depth to make up for him being out for a little bit here with Derek White, with Malcolm Brogdon, Grant Williams, all three of those guys played really, really well in that win over the Philadelphia 76ers. But certainly Jalen Brown having a career year this year, career high in scoring, career high in field goal percentage, has been obviously a rock nest to Jason Tatum with the Celtics leading the league this year, making his second All-Star team. And obviously the Celtics will be hoping to get him back sometime here soon with the All-Star break coming up. Uh, a facial fracture for Jalen Brown. Hopefully he's back sooner rather than later. Probably going to be wearing a mask, you would think, with, with something like that. Tim Bontemps, thank you very much. Uh, most of the moves we saw, though, it, it was folks leaving the Eastern Conference, namely Kevin Durant leaving the Two Brooklyn Eastern Nets. Eastern Conference's starters in All-Star. In the All-Star. Right, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant. No longer in the East, but will still start for the East. It's a whole it's a whole thing. Um, but as we look at the East, as we look at the contenders particularly that made some little moves, what stood out to you, Zach? I think what stands out is that the top three in the East, the gap between them and everybody else got bigger today. Mm. Boston, little upgrade. Mike Muscala may not be that sexy, but can hit some threes off the bench. Gives them some insurance, I think, if Robert Williams the third has to miss some games in the playoffs. Philadelphia, nobody's watching the Hornets. I get it. No one watches the Hornets. Jalen McDaniels is pretty good. And I think he's an upgrade for what they need on Matisse Thibel, who's shooting and just sort of lack of comfort with the ball and the flow of the offense was just not going to be a good fit with Embiid in the playoffs, despite the fact that he's an incredible defender. I like that move for them. And then Milwaukee with Jay Crowder, that rounds out their team. So I think those three, in little ways, they're not going to get headlines. They're, they're going to be the 19th paragraph of the trade deadline recap. All those deals are pretty solid deals. Keep an eye on that McDaniels kid in Philly. He's good. You know, uh, they spent some money, Malika. Um, Boston hasn't spent in the, in the tax in over a decade. This deal increased their, increased their outlay into the tax. And then you look at the deal that Milwaukee made. Milwaukee is at the absolute edge of what they can spend as an ownership operation. This move, again, pushing the boundaries. So both of these teams making moves, spending more money because they're going for the championship this year. Mm. And I think especially Milwaukee – Milwaukee has to feel pretty good about where they are because they haven't been whole for the whole first half. Chris Middleton is just now rounding into form. Yep. He's played a couple of nice games in the last week. They've won eight in a row. They feel good about themselves. Also, the Cleveland Cavaliers feel good about themselves. They have played much better over the last 10 days. Mm. Their offense, which was really sagging as they went through a, about a 17-game span where they yeah. had about 500, they have played really well those last couple of, of maybe the last week, week and a half, and they didn't feel like they need to do anything. All right, so I mentioned that that need to do anything. The Cavaliers were one of two teams who officially didn't do anything, uh, them and the Chicago Bulls. And then I know Miami Heat fans are like, what about us? Well, technically, the, the Dwayne uh, Dedmond, yeah. who was shipped out, I know it's not getting a player back. What was the thought process for Miami? I, well, first off, Miami was skin tight on, mm -hmm. the, uh, on, the, on the luxury tax, mm -hmm. and they also needed a roster spot. So they, they just sort of made a luxury tax move. They, they were really – this is how – Diplomatically, I would say it. Mm. They were motivated to trade Dwayne Dedman. Uh, if you remember, he was suspended recently for heaving a, a massage gun out onto the court. Um, they were ready to move on from Dwayne Dedman, and they, it was the first time in the 35 year history of the team they did a trade with San Antonio to do so. So that's what they did. They opened up some space. So watch out for Miami in the mm. buyout market. Mm. Miami is always active in this situation. They opened up some, a roster spot and some, some salary space to do it. Westbrook has come up. I would keep an eye on other players who may become available. There might be a player or two, Zach, who is like, wait a minute. Miami has a roster spot, a little bit of money to spend. I might not mind going to Miami. It wouldn't surprise me if there's some maneuvers as we speak going on where a player or two could pop free. Hmm, maneuvers going on as we speak. The deals are never done. I want to go back to the top of the East for just a second, though, bring Tim back into this conversation because Philly just had a, a rough game against Boston. They were held to under 100 points. Did they do enough to compete? And we're talking about the Bucks. And we're talking about the Celtics, the juggernauts of the East. Did they do enough to compete? Well, I think that remains to be seen, Malika. We'll see if the, the Sixers can add a big in the buyout market to play behind Joel Embiid. Um, but if you look at the way this played out, I think Zach really summed it up nicely in that I think the Celtics and Bucks have been the two best teams in the East all season long, and that remains the case after this trade deadline. Philly got out of the tax, made a nice little move to get 
uh, Jalen McDaniels from Charlotte moving Matisse Thibel out, but they did not really add any kind of you know difference maker to improve their roster. Whereas you saw Boston go out and get Mike Muscala, who's going to help them as a depth big, and you saw Milwaukee go get Jay Crowder to give them some depth, the guy mm. they've been trying to get for a while. So to me, I think those two teams are going to stay at the top of the East, assuming health. And one thing I think to point out too, you know, you were just talking about Miami. I think it's going to be an interesting battle between Miami the Knicks, and the Nets to see which of those two, th- two of those three teams are going to stay in the top six in the East. You kind of assume the Nets are going to fall out of that because of the trades they made, but they've got a pretty good-looking team. When you look at Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, Cam Johnson, Mikael Bridges, and Nick Claxton, that's a pretty solid starting five, and they've got a few-game head start on those teams behind them. So I also think when you're talking about teams trying to position for the playoffs and how things are going to shake out, that's going to be pretty important to see how those two, how those three teams line up here over the final few weeks of the season. Absolutely solid, sure, but you're looking at the Bucks and the so, like. That's the thing is that's the what bar. The Mets are looking that's for a, in this era. The bar is high. Solid starting five. That's a great <laughs> point, though. I haven't thought about the Brooklyn Nets record in like 48 hours. <laughs> it's actually pretty good. They're four games ahead of the Knicks. 18 out of 20. Yeah, but who cares about winning? Who cares about winning? <laughs> Zach, don't do this to me. Our five, don't don't do this to me. I can name a few. The Celtics, uh, Tim mentioned this, no shortage of bigs. We know that the Celtics, they they love their big men. But should they have looked to potentially add another wing to this roster? Well, they really prioritized getting insurance for Robert Williams because obviously he's so important. And from what I understand, they really scoured the big man market Mm. to try to see what they could do to add to this roster. It always helps to have a, a big who can stretch the floor. Muscala was just here across the street the other night and was lighting the Lakers up mm. on their sluggish rotations, nailing threes. Um, I'm sure the Celtics watched that game and were like, you know what, we might like to have that guy as an option. Um, the thing about the Celtics is last year in the postseason, there were times, Malika, where I, I felt like they could only trust about seven guys. And if one of those seven guys like tweaked his ankle or got in foul trouble, all of a sudden it got narrow. They have added some depth to this roster where that, that that can go to nine guys or so and that makes a difference when you're looking at a playoff run i felt like they ran out of gas in the finals last year when they got to the to the warriors and they've tried to address that specifically with malcolm brogdon yep. who's really the leader for six man of the year which- and I, I think they played their cards right on the big man thing because they looked at Jakob purtle as, as sort of like, well, he's the best guy available. Should we get him? And it ended up only costing one first-round pick for Toronto to get Jakob Pertl back. That's a nice reunion up there. And I think the Celtics decided, if we're talking about ultimately like an insurance policy, right. like it, we just can't splurge first-round picks on that. Let's see what we can get at a lower price point. Mike Muscala makes sense. Also, Mike Muscala, I think it's a signal also that the Thunder are okay if they don't necessarily finish this really feel-good season for them as strongly as they've played yeah, recently because he's been a, he's been a big quiet, big part of their best tank. lineups well, a couple of quiet tank maneuvers I wouldn't even say tank but it's just like they're, they're they get a little worse with that I mean no one cares because it's a thunder it's Mike Muscala they're good when he's on the floor and yep. they're going to be they don't have those minutes anymore Mike Muscala heading to the sec- to the Celtics you mentioned not giving up a first round pick we've seen a lot of second round picks flying around oh today. my god five second round picks for Gary Payton the second you talked about this a little bit earlier Zach I want to bring Tim in on this one um, because I, I just I want folks to understand, Tim, why are teams valuing second-round picks like this all of a sudden? Well, I mean, we talk about inflation in the economy, right? And me and Bobby Marks were joking earlier. There's been inflation, I think, in the second-round pick market. And and it's for a couple of reasons, Malika. One is, obviously, you look at these contending teams, right? You look at Milwaukee. You look at the Clippers. um, You look at these teams that have already traded a ton of their first-round picks. They don't have first-round picks to trade in deals, right? So they have to get creative. They have to find second round picks to move. And then on top of that, you know, over over the last several years, we've seen teams try to hold on to these first round picks, whereas, you know, second round picks have become more the currency to make these sort of, you know, rotation roster filling moves. You saw Thomas Bryant go for three second round picks. We saw Rui Hachimura go for three second round picks. Luke Kennard go for three second round picks. And then, as you mentioned, Jay Crowder and Gary Payton, you know, two of the bigger names that move today, those guys move for five first round picks. I mean, that obviously is a pretty big number. You're talking, you know, over 20 picks moved in five or Mm. six trades. But I think it's the combination of teams not wanting to park with first round picks they don't have to. And also a lot of these contending teams looking to make upgrades, just not having them available and having to get creative to make the kind of moves they want to upgrade their rosters. The Atlanta Hawks traded seven second round picks today. Seven. Seven. And they have seven left. They trade only traded half of them. They have. Seven second round. How many second round picks would it take me to trade to Bristol to get Bond Temps to be in Los Angeles? Less than seven. <laughs> less than seven. Can I, can I say something about the Sixers? Yep. 
The Sixers should be almost insulted by the way we talk about them on this show. Like that they're this little, little poor pseudo contender below the Celtics and the Bucks, who are these super teams that are eons better than them. I just don't like, to me, this should be considered a big three in these. You have Joel Embiid. Yeah. Some people would say he's a front runner for MVP or at least a co front runner. James Harden, everyone's whining that he didn't make the All Star team, and I agree with the whining. I think he, he should have made. All Star. I think he should have made the. I just think he should have made it already. Tyrese Maxey's coming off the bench now. You loaded up with the Indian, the Anthony Melton. You just made another trade. Yeah. I I just we the the expectations for them. I know James Harden has had a lot of bad elimination games in the playoffs. There are trust issues there. The expectations for them should be just about as high yeah. as they are for Milwaukee but and then Boston. They have a game I would, like I last would night. agree. There's no way they should have lost that game last night in Boston. I, yeah, then, well, then, that's, then, that's, then we can really hit them then because they have the talent. They have all the ingredients they mm-hmm. need. We shouldn't be sitting here talking about them like, oh, what? They got a puncher's chance. They should have more than a puncher's chance. I, I think Brian's, last word on this. Go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think to Brian's point, look, uh, Philly obviously played Denver uh, not too long ago in Philly. Nikola Jokic and Joel Embiid, an MVP race showdown. Joel Embiid played great. Philly won that game, right? But then, as you said, Malika, earlier on in the segment, they played Boston last night. Boston has four of their starters out in the second half. Jay, you know, Jalen Brown doesn't play the second half of that game. They have three starters missing the whole game. Philly's disjointed out of sorts and loses that game, right? I think people want to see at this point, it's put up or shut up time with Philly. And mm. I, I think people Darn understand, right. I think people are going to wait to see them actually advance out of the second round of the playoffs before right. they put them in the same tier as the two teams that have gotten out of the Eastern Conference. I just want to be clear. Seasons. I don't disagree that it's put up or shut up time. I want them to put up. Like right. they have all the ingredients and there's a massive amount at stake for them. James Harden could be a free agent after this season. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.